Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Husey, and I'm Director of Strategic Return Studies at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and I want to welcome you to our Nuclear Deterrent Series. We are very pleased this morning to have Dr. Mark Schneider, who is joining us today. Dr. Schneider is a senior analyst at the National Institute for Public Policy, where he specializes in missile defense policy, nuclear weapons, arms control verification, and compliance. He previously served in a number of senior positions within the Office of the Secretary of Defense and has chaired several working groups of the START and INF Treaty Implementation Commissions. Welcome back, Dr. Schneider, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. I would like to turn it over to you for some opening remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to be filling in today for uh, Dr. Steve Blank. By the way, anything I say about uh, Russian nuclear doctrine, including the new aspects you can find in his publications 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, he is a national asset. Anyway, uh, we are um, in a uh, very uh, interesting period uh, in the classic sense of the word that uh, if you're living in interested times, your life expectancy might not be too high. Um, we have found out uh, we got a very limited taste of what a WMD war would be like when uh, we got hit by COVID-19. Uh, and, and that's not even a real uh, biological weapon. And it gives you some idea what the effect of WMD weapons can have on our society. Uh, Russia uh, uh, is a uh, nation that has a uh, rather unique uh, nuclear doctrine. Uh, it uh, has, uh, in all probability, the lowest uh, nuclear weapons use threshold uh, in the world, and that may even be uh, declining. Uh, in 2020, we um, got a lot of confirmation uh, of our worst fears about uh, Russian nuclear doctrine. In June 2020, uh, President Putin signed and uh, made public a decree on nuclear deterrence. Uh, that decree um, confirmed uh, some of the most alarming aspects of unofficial Russian press reports, including reports in state media about what they're um, planning uh, to do uh, with regard uh, to uh, uh, nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, as uh, distinguished Russian journalist Pavel Felgengauer pointed out uh, last year, uh, quote, the Kremlin is uh, constantly playing deterrence, the deterrence game uh, by trying to scare the West. But the situation has two dangerous ramifications. First, the, the nuclear threshold is becoming lower. Uh, in any serious uh, skirmish, the Russian Navy would either have uh, to use, go nuclear or risk being sunk. And second, the Russian leadership believes it has surpassed the West militarily, thanks to its dazzling super weapons. And of course, these are all nuclear or nuclear capable. Uh, Moscow's threshold of the employment of military force uh, in conflict continue, uh, situations may also drop further. Uh, it's now clear uh, that um, the, um, as I mentioned, the press reports about very low Russian nuclear weapons use threshold are, are accurate because they're in paragraph 19 of uh, Putin's decree. Um, he lists four conditions for the use of, of uh, first use of nuclear weapons. Uh, <clears throat> the first of, of these uh, is uh, uh, launch of uh, ballistic missiles uh, against Russia or its uh, allies. The second is uh, the use of nuclear weapons or any type of mass destruction against uh, the um, Soviet, excuse me, the Russian Federation or its allies. Uh, the third is an attack by an adversary on uh, critical government or military sites uh, of the Russian Federation, the disruption of which uh, would undermine uh, a nuclear forces response actions. Uh, and th a fourth, uh, aggression uh, against the, the Russian Federation by the use of conventional weapons when the very existence of, of the state was in jeopardy. Until the publication of, of, doc of this document, the uh, number D, uh, the uh, existence of the state formulation was supposedly their nuclear doctrine. Uh, this was routinely um, 
uh, contradicted uh, in Russian media, including state media. And it turned out that these reports were unfortunately very much uh, on the mark. Uh, there are a number of very threatening aspects in, in paragraph 19 of, of, of the decree. Uh, first, Pavel Falgenauer says uh, that in reality, uh, it could mean a nuclear response to a single ballistic missile launch uh, against Russia before the Russians knew whether it was nuclear or uh, non-nuclear. Uh, the second was they changed the formulation uh, relating to um, uh, uh, chemical and biological attack to weapons of mass destruction, which is much broader and, and could involve uh, uh, many other things. Uh, third, uh, the formulation uh, of, of attacks that would disrupt uh, their nuclear uh, uh, forces uh, and command and control is very uh, s significant because they didn't say strategic nuclear forces, they said nuclear forces. And since everything is dual capable uh, in Russia, basically that can be read as saying you hit any, any, any type of Russian military base, uh, you're disrupting their nuclear forces because uh, they have nuclear capable systems at every level um, in their military. Uh, so that is uh, quite uh, disturbing. I think the intent of the formulation here is to try to deter a U.S. conventional attack on anything in, in uh, Russia other than along the, the border in the event of uh, a, a war, which means uh, a Russian attack on, on one of the, the NATO states. And if they succeed in preventing us from waging a serious conventional uh, response against a Russian NATO invasion of NATO territory, uh, we're going to lose the war. So um, we, um, we now have a much better understanding, um, uh, undeniable really, uh, of what Russian nuclear doctrine is about. It's one other interesting thing in the doctrinal document. It, it talks about using nuclear weapons when sovereignty or territorial integrity of Russia is threatened. Those are pretty ambiguous concepts. So when you take a look at what Putin has said, um, over the years about what threatens Russian sovereignty. It's some pretty minor things. Uh, I, I mean, a bad editorial uh, in a major Russian publication is, uh, in his view, a threat to Russian sovereignty. Now, I'm not suggesting he would nuke us in response to a New York Times editorial, but uh, he certainly uh, has a very low threshold for, for, for uh, nuclear uh, first use. Certainly, um, Russia, um, there was a lot of talk in Moscow today about preemptive attacks uh, against uh, um, NATO. Uh, and that's very interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, a uh, interesting study uh, by Harvard, the Belfer Center, uh, looked at uh, military thought, which is the official uh, uh, journal of the Russian uh, defense uh, or general staff. Uh, and uh, they found at least 18 articles uh, in this publication advocating preemption against uh, NATO. That's a very, uh, very uh, important document. Now, um, Putin himself in 2015 made a rather remarkable statement. Uh, basically, he linked nuclear strategy to the tactics of street fighting. And this is a direct quote out of uh, uh, Putin's uh, speech to the Valde uh, Forum, which is a uh, ec uh, international economics forum. He said, 50 years ago, I learned one rule on the streets of Leningrad. Uh, it is, if a fight is uh, inevitable, uh, be uh, the first to strike. And I think that's pretty much his nuclear doctrine. Uh, Dr. Steve Blank about uh, 20 years ago noted that, quote, essentially there is no clear fire break between conventional and nuclear scenarios in, in Russian open sources. And I think he was absolutely correct. Um, central to Russian nuclear strategy is the concept of uh, escalate to de-escalate or uh, more accurately, uh, escalate uh, to, um, to win. This goes back officially uh, 
to 2003 uh, in a, a document published by the Russian Defense Ministry. I believe it actually dates from uh, the earliest uh, Putin uh, doctrinal uh, uh, statement in uh, uh, 1999. Uh, again, as Dr. Blank uh, wrote, Arguably, escalation dominance is merely a part of a much uh, broader nuclear strategy that uh, relies heavily on the psycho psychological and the intimidating uh, composition uh, component of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, in 2017, the Director of Defense Nuclear Agency said we see them routinely practicing escalate to de-escalate. Uh, uh, in their military exercises. Uh, uh, I think there's no question about that. Uh, just about every major nuclear, uh, ev any, every major uh, military exercise conducted in Russia uh, over the last uh, two decades uh, is reportedly goes nuclear at the end. So um, we have a doctrine which is um, disturbing to say the least. Uh, if I had to sum it up, uh, in uh, a single sentence, it, it, it uh, would be they'll use nuclear weapons anytime uh, there's a major conflict and they think it's in, in their national interest. From a deterrent standpoint, it's our job to make sure they don't think it's in their national interest to do this. And that's critically important in light of the possible consequences of the introduction of nuclear weapons into to warfare. Um, we uh, have no official U.S. government statement on the estimated number of, of uh, Russian nuclear uh, weapons, the total number. Um, I think it's clear that it is much larger uh, than our own. Uh, in December uh, 2019, the head of the uh, Russian ICBM force said that they had reduced uh, their uh, uh, strategic nuclear forces um, by uh, two thirds from the end of the Cold War. That contrasts dramatically with the uh, previous uh, Russian statements claiming an 85% reduction. The, the effect of this is if you do the math and you get their estimates of, of, or their statements about the size of the Soviet strategic nuclear forces, and you see, you, you see this into, in, the, in the original Star Treaty database, it means they've got over uh, 3,300 uh, deployed nuclear warheads right now. Um, and um, we uh, certainly um, have um, in the last year a, a lot of very interesting statements about the size of their capability, some of them, some of them by U.S. government officials. For example, uh, just a uh, less than a month ago, General Hyten, uh, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said they have thousands of, of low-yield nuclear weapons, both strategic uh, and uh, tactical. Uh, that confirms, uh, more or less anyway, uh, a significant number of reports about the scale of Russian uh, low-yield uh, nuclear weapons production. Uh, and. Uh, he um, stated that we have to deter this with our much smaller low yield force. And uh, it is certainly much smaller, no question about that. Uh, the, uh, non, the, can, the, the nuclear low yield trident, uh, there hasn't been any formal release of a number. Hans Christensen and Matt Corbett, the Federation of American Scientists, uh, say uh, we've got under 25, and we're talking about thousands on, on, on the Russian. Um, on, on the Russian side. So that's an alarming uh, comparison. Um, there is uh, other evidence of large scale Russian uh, production of, of uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, the uh, 2019 the Director of Defense Intelligence Agency said they had actually increased recently their nuclear weapons production capability to thousands per year. Uh, in light of the US pit facility, uh, scheduled for about 2030, we're going to build up to 80 a year. So there's a massive disparity there. Uh, uh, rather uh, amazingly, earlier this week, a, a German publication got a hold of a uh, German defense ministry document, which uh, said that the Russians had 6,375 uh, operational nuclear warheads. Uh, that apparently is uh, significantly higher than the, the threat level that was assumed in the, the uh, 2018 uh, US nuclear uh, posture review. 
Bill Gertz uh, has stated uh, in a number of publications that Russia is in the process of uh, increasing its nuclear forces. They're going to build up to uh, 8,000 uh, nuclear warheads by uh, 2026. And in 2019, um, then uh, Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, Defense for Nuclear Matters, a Rear Admiral re retired Peter Fanta, confirmed the the uh, the uh, eight thousand number as their goal. Um, it is clear that th their force is several times larger than us. Uh, to to quote uh, Hans Christensen and uh, Matt Korba, Federation of American Scientists, and I don't think you can accuse either one of them as likely to uh, uh, understate our nuclear capability. Uh, they say we've got. Um, 1,800 deployed warheads, 1,400 on, on strategic missiles and 300 bomber bases and 100 uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons uh, at our bases in Europe, that, that total under 2,000. So we're talking about several to one um, existing uh, Russian lead and it's, and it's almost certainly going to increase in, uh, over the next decade. Uh, Russia, is modernizing its strategic forces. Uh, 1997 was an interesting year. The uh, last US uh, uh, strategic system, Legacy Cold War, uh, B-2 bomber uh, entered the US inventory. Uh, since that time, uh, in, as a matter of fact, in 1997, the Russians began to deploy the first version of the new SS-27 um, Mod 1, or, or they call it the Topo M variant 2 uh, system. And since that time, uh, they have officially announced, or in some cases, the fence industry announced for them, having gotten contracts for uh, somewhere between 20 and 25 strategic, uh, uh, new strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, a few of them are updates of Cold War systems, but almost all of them uh, are uh, completely uh, new uh, systems. That's uh, that's an amazing uh, situation to be in. Um, Stratcom Commander uh, Admiral uh, Charles Richards um, in uh, February uh, wrote an article in Naval Institute Proceedings uh, where he summarized what their strategic uh, uh, nuclear uh, programs are. And what he, what he said was the strategic capabilities of our competitors continue to grow and they are sobering. More than a decade ago, Russia began aggressively modernizing its nuclear forces, including uh, the non-treaty uh, accountable medium and short range systems. Uh, it's modernizing uh, bombers, intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles, nuclear powered ballistic missile submarines, warning systems, command and control capabilities, uh, and the doctrine to uh, underpin their employment. In short, its entire strategic force structure. The, this modernization is about 70% complete and on track to be fully uh, completed within a few years. In addition, Russia is building new and novel systems like hypersonic glide vehicles, nuclear armed and uh, nuclear powered torpedoes, uh, uh, cruise missiles and other capabilities. Um, so uh, we, we have, um, and this is, he's really, here he's talking about things that have already happened. There are a whole bunch of things, of course, that they're doing that haven't quite happened yet. Uh, in December, 2020, um, uh, Russian Defense Minister General of the Army, Sergei Shoigu, said they had modernized 86% uh, of their uh, strategic nuclear forces, and they would reach 88.3% this year. The difference between Admiral Richard's 70% and Shoigu's 86% doesn't appear to be substantive. It appears to be definitional. The Russians count the Delta IV submarines with their new uh, Sinova and uh, liner missiles as modern systems, and we don't. Uh, but however you, you, you define uh, modern systems, the U.S. numbers right now, unfortunately, zero. Um, Russia um, is, um, 
has announced uh, in December 2019, it will complete its modernization uh, of its strategic forces in 2024. Now, I want to make sure you understand uh, that their dates are based on best case assumptions. You slip them every one of them a year or two, you probably be, uh, get the right ones. But uh, certainly, they're going to complete the modernization of their entire strategic nuclear force before we even begin ours. And another fact you really got to keep in mind is it's not that um, uh, modernization goes on, they replace the Cold War legacy systems, they get the new ones, and then they uh, stop for the next few decades. They modernize and then modernize the modernized systems and then introduce new systems to replace the new and modernized systems. And that's what they're doing. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, in December uh, 2020, the commander of the strategic uh, uh, missile forces uh, said that within uh, the short and midterm, they're going to start on uh, several uh, new uh, ICBM projects. And, you know, we're debating uh, whether we go ahead with one. Uh, they've already fielded uh, uh, three newer modified ICBMs. They're, according to them, on, on the verge of introducing the, the Sarmat heavy ICBM in 2022. I would slip that a couple years, but uh, that will certainly come along. And, and their announced program involves a massive deployment of that, uh, something that can't possibly fit into any arms control regime. So um, we are uh, facing uh, a, a major uh, uh, and growing nuclear threat. There are at least six pro announced programs right now. Uh, they have at least six uh, hypersonic uh, missile programs ranging from 1,000 to uh, uh, full kilometers to full ICBM ranges. They're all nuclear armed or nuclear capable, and there are probably more coming. As a matter of fact, they've announced that newer types are, are going to be built. So. Uh, we uh, are facing a rapidly growing threat there. It's not, some of these are clearly strategic uh, 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 for a number of them, whether you call them non-strategic or strategic is, is rather arbitrary because it depends on what platform you put them on. They're gonna put them on surface ships, submarines and bombers of all types, including new, new types of bombers. So uh, we're, we're going to face a major threat uh, here. And uh, they're act actually uh, hinting very strongly about using the hypersonic missiles for uh, uh, preemptive strikes against the US National Command Authority. Uh, Putin himself made a veiled threat about this, and, and it was a, a not very veiled threat by the uh, chief of their general staff in, in uh, 2019. So um, we are facing that. Uh, the non-strategic force, it, again, it is massive because of the increasing ranges here of the non-strategic weapons, uh, up to now 4,000 kilometers. Uh, whether you classify some of these as strategic or non-strategic, it's pretty arbitrary. Uh, they can do both of, uh, of the missions. Official U.S. numbers, 2,000 uh, and growing. Uh, I believe, uh, based on, on Russian sources, Russian government statements, and a variety of, of uh, other sources, that it's over 5,000. Uh, and uh, very recently, um, uh, Sergei Rogov, a very noted uh, uh, Russian expert uh, on this, uh, and a moderate by Russian standards, says they've got somewhere between 3,000 and 10,000 non-strategic nuclear weapons. And it's basically the entire uh, Cold War uh, inventory of weapons uh, um, with um, updated uh, capabilities. And uh, uh, I, <clears throat> we've got, uh, compa by comparison, nothing. We've got, uh, according to Corba, 100 uh, um, uh, gravity bombs deployed in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a program underway for a, a nuclear slickum, but it, it, we, it doesn't even have an official IOC date as far as I can determine right now. So uh, they're going to have a, a major uh, advantage for a long, long time to come. Um, bottom line conclusions on this, the impact for deterrence, uh, nuclear deterrence is, is absolutely critical. The consequences for the failure of, of deterrence can, uh, can make the um, uh, COVID-19 epidemic look uh, like a tea party. Um, 
Russia, I believe, will initiate uh, nuclear uh, attacks in any major conflict when they see it in their interests, and we have to make sure they don't see it in, in their interest. And minimum deterrence is not a way to, uh, to do that. Um, I think we have uh, been sort of sleepwalking toward minimum deterrence for a long time. Uh, that will dramatically, if that continues, uh, it will dramatically in increase the uh, risk of um, war and, and uh, nuclear escalation. And it's not going to be an American president who pulls the trigger. Um, the um, modernization of our forces are critical. Uh, we're at a situation now that they're so old that we either modernize them, replace them with new systems, or we lose the deterrent capability. Haven't tested nuclear weapons in 20 years, and uh, the Russians have. Uh, that's a major asymmetry in and of itself. Uh, until the, um, uh, the announcement of the uh, Mark uh, 93 uh, program, um, for a, a new type of, of nuclear weapon. We hadn't done anything uh, in uh, over three decades. Uh, that's a very critical program that should uh, uh, continue. Um, we have to uh, take the Russian threat uh, very seriously as our leaders have, have uh, she, uh, Pentagon leaders have, have now said for, for many years. Uh, and uh, we need a, a deterrent. Numbers are important too. Uh, and uh, we uh, we need to maximize deterrence because of the, of the consequences of the failure of deterrence. We don't want to find out uh, whether uh, you can fight a limited nuclear war. And Putin is just the person to try to start a limited nuclear war, particularly one where they assume, and this is all over the doctrinal literature, that they can use nuclear weapons first and we won't respond. That's a really bad perception and is one that we should work, do everything we can to change. And, and literally in the last two years, we've begun to do that. Uh, we've conducted exercises of a type we haven't done um, since the Cold War and exercises of, of the type that the Russians have done uh, consistently uh, through uh, uh, the post-Cold War period. So we're beginning to send signals, the right signals. I hope that uh, continues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And I'm going to go to a couple questions now. You have mentioned uh, the extent of Russia's nuclear modernization. Let's go to a point that you and Steve have, uh, Blank, uh, historically have talked about is what do the Russians want to do with the new modernization that they're doing? What are their geopolitical ambitions that they believe these nuclear weapons will give them the ability to do? They, uh, they see uh, nuclear weapons as not only deterrent assets, but um, major warfighting assets. Clearly, the scope of, of their programs is, is much more than deterrence. The large introduction of, of uh, low yield, and very low yield uh, nuclear weapons uh, is very stark uh, evidence of that. And fortunately, now we have a official U.S. Uh, confirmation uh, that the uh, press reports we were seeing uh, in Russia and, and some uh, in the United States were, were accurate on, on the scale of um, their uh, capabilities. Uh, they make no, um, no secret that they want to dominate former uh, uh, Soviet space, uh, and they clearly want to also dominate Western Europe to the extent uh, that they can. Now, you're, you're dealing with a nation uh, which has a gross national pro product roughly the same size as Spain and Italy that wants to be perceived as a superpower. Well, you don't have the economic power to do that. You've got a large army by uh, Western uh, uh, standards today, uh, but not uh, nearly big enough to conquer NATO. But you have a, a nuclear capability which vastly exceeds uh, probably anyway, the rest of the world combined. Uh, and that's the temptation to use this. Uh, and when you throw in classic Russian paranoia and Putin uh, is extremely paranoid. And at the same time, he regards Russian, you know, historic Russian imperialism going back to the czarist period as completely legitimate. Uh, and uh, you put that together with, uh, 
you know, uh, nuclear weapons and a low nuclear weapons use threshold, that, that gets pretty, uh, pretty threatening. Uh, and as I say, it's our uh, job uh, to prevent him from ever believing uh, he can win a war. Uh, and uh, that means uh, preventing him from believing that his uh, escalate to de-escalate or escalate to win strategy is going to work. Uh, and uh, that's a very important objective. And to do that, you're going to have to put some serious uh, resources in rebuilding our nuclear deterrent capability. Uh, in some respects, it's literally at the, the point of collapse. The, the, the nuclear weapons production complex, some elements of it go back to the Manhattan Project, which is literally amazing. Uh, the, the Russian nuclear uh, production complex is, is fully functional and according to the director of DIA, can produce thousands of nuclear weapons a year, new types. And they have developed new types. They said that the weapons uh, that they're developing for the new nuclear weapons are new types. And they improved uh, military capabilities. Uh, and there are many, many reports that they're uh, developing very advanced uh, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, very low uh, collateral damage, very low fission products. We're not doing any of that. We haven't done any of that in, in over 30 years. And that's pretty disturbing, quite frankly. Let me ask you a question that uh, I was going to ask anyway, but it also in the Q&A, some of our con uh, participants have asked. There are those who advocate going to just bombers and submarines. And we get rid of the ICBM leg of the triad. What instabilities might arise and how would Russia react to the United States basically reducing our strategic nuclear delivery vehicles from 700 to 300? And as General Hyten has pointed out, reduce the number of assets that someone would have to target to from 500 to basically around 10. Could you address that, Mark? Well, it, it's they would love it simplify very in a very serious way uh, the possibility of effective preemptive uh, uh, nuclear strikes uh, that would take out most of our nuclear capability and could take out our national command authority. Uh, and uh, that the, I believe the triad is an essential base for the deterrence. Uh, we need a strategic triad and I would take it one step further. We need a non-strategic triad and we don't have that today, uh, where the Russians do. Uh, they have uh, uh, many uh, tactical or non-strategic nuclear weapons of every category. Uh, they have land-based, sea-based, air-based. Uh, and uh, we, uh, you know, we're left with, a, 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 until we get the, uh, the B-61 Mod 12 into the inventory, that's I think a few years away, uh, we we have uh, a 1960 vintage gravity bomb, a 1980 vintage, uh, well, it, the 80 vintage bomb is strategic, not non-strategic. But uh, that's it. Uh, Air Force magazine, the latest issue, uh, published a uh, statement by the Air Force Association, and it talked about the need to modernize our fighter aircraft. It pointed out the average age of a fighter aircraft is 28 years, and most of them can't penetrate modern defenses. If you rephrase that and, uh, and talked about our nuclear-capable fighter force, uh, you would say that uh, the, the average age is about the same, 28 years, but none of them can penetrate uh, modern defenses. And that won't change until the F-35 comes on board with uh, uh, nuclear capability. Um, and by the way, uh, their version of a stealth aircraft, the Su-57, I don't really believe it's a true stealth aircraft. It's not fifth generation, really. But it's going to carry a hypersonic missile, probably nu 
almost certainly nuclear capable uh, and with a range of uh, over a thousand kilometers uh, be my guess based on the physical size of it compared to the, the tinsel and it's going to be carried internally so uh, you're going to have and that missile according to a recent Russian press report is going to be uh, suddenly appear on a whole bunch of other um, Russian uh, 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 non-strategic aircraft uh, fighters and, and uh, you know attack aircraft so uh, we're, we're going uh, to have a much uh, uh, more capable uh, Russian uh, non-strategic force. And major elements of that force will literally be capable of, of, of strategic as well as, as non-strategic use. Uh, the announced range on some of their uh, cruise missiles uh, is now 4,000 kilometers with nuclear warheads on them. And, uh, you know, uh, according to... Um, uh, one Russian uh, admiral, vice uh, commander of the uh, Russian Navy at the time, low yield nuclear warheads. Let me ask you a question on, you mentioned it earlier about what General Hyten described as the Putin doctrine of escalate to win. Others have called it escalate to end a conflict on their terms. Others have criticized that assessment and said, no, it's Russia just wants to manage uh, the es escalatory ladder called escalation dominance. And it's been a long time concern of ours that if God forbid nuclear weapons are ever used, you'd wanna be able to stop a fight before it gets out of hand. Could you address the, the little bit more on the criticism that it's really nothing new, that it's a defensive uh, position of the Russians that escalate to win doesn't really have any offensive characteristic in mind? That view uh, is literally um, uh, head in the sand uh, thinking. Uh, the uh, escalate to de-escalate uh, uh, doctrine uh, got a lot of publicity. I mean, before 2015, you, you find it in, in uh, professional literature, a handful of experts worldwide were pointing uh, this out and going back about 20 years. In 2015, the uh, Obama administration at the most senior level started talking about this and pointing out how dangerous it is. Deputy uh, Secretary of, uh, of Defense, uh, Chair, Vice Chairman of the Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff said it was playing with fire and that's exactly what it is. Uh, and uh, you will find uh, that uh, in uh, publications by the Defense Science Board in the Obama administration, uh, the National Intelligence Council of the Obama administration. This is not really debatable. This, it's there, it's, it, you can go out and find it uh, in the literature. Uh, and, uh, they practice this on in their exercises, uh, as a director of the Defense Intelligence Agency stated in, in 2017. This is real, uh, and it's not the de defensive uh, in the sense uh, that, uh, despite their paranoia, they know full well that NATO is not going to attack them, uh, and they are threatening uh, NATO uh, across the board. They're large. Uh, theater exercises, Zapad, and there'll be another version of Zapad this year, uh, go nuclear, uh, reportedly 100% of the time. Uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, they see nuclear weapons as one of their uh, ace cards. I, I mean, since uh, 2007, when they started making overt nuclear threats, it's probably something on the order of 30 or, or 40 statements by the most senior Russian government officials, including the presidents of Russia, both of them, uh, about uh, using nuclear weapons yeah, and nuclear escalation uh, and uh, attacking specific uh, targets with them. Uh, and. Uh, this is not. Uh, this is not. This doesn't go on anywhere outside of of, of uh, Russia. Well, maybe one exception, North Korea, but that's sort of a crazy state in itself. Uh, the leadership there are pretty wild. But uh, certainly among uh, major um, uh, European states, Russia is the only country that talks about nuclear first use. That, threatens targeting, that generals make statements about targeting specific targets in, in NATO states. Russian ambassadors make statements about targeting specific uh, targets in NATO states with nuclear weapons. It's, it's amazing. 
Uh, the Orthodox Church uh, has views on nuclear uh, um, uh, warfare, nuclear deterrence uh, that are fundamentally different uh, from any other uh, religious body in the world. It's, uh, uh, I mean, some of it's absolutely amazing. Thank you, Mark. I have another uh, question and that is, given your uh, emphasis, and I think it's a correct one, that we should do everything possible to prevent the Russians from thinking that they can use nuclear weapons and be successful in whatever their objectives are. What would you recommend to the Biden administration in terms of adopting policies, either consistent with the past two, three administrations or something new? What would you recommend that they do in order to ensure that the Russians don't think that they can use nuclear weapons in a conflict or in a crisis and be successful in so doing? Well, certainly, number one, don't uh, cut or eliminate elements of the modernization program that's underway. Uh, it's actually uh, uh, the Obama administration program. The, uh, there were no real changes to the uh, strategic triad in the 2018 uh, nuclear posture review. You know, uh, continue the, the, certainly keep deployed the small number of low yield Trident uh, weapons. Uh, you know, go on with the development of of the um, uh, the uh, nuclear uh, submarine uh, launch cruise missile, and, and uh, uh, if if anything, uh, uh, accelerate it. Uh, uh, we we need uh, to uh, move away from a, a monad. That's what we have in, in the not, in the sub strategic or non strategic area right now. All we got is gravity bombs. Uh, we have the um, strategic. Uh, low yield trident, but that's a strategic weapon. The Russians, by the way, have that too. Uh, that, that appeared initially in state media uh, 10, uh, 12 years ago. And it's quite possible based on a, a number of statements uh, by their officials and, and reports in the state media that every new designed Russian nuclear weapon uh, since the end of the Cold War has a low yield option on it. And unlike uh, our um, uh, could our nuclear, uh, low yield nuclear trident, which really isn't the low yield weapon, it's just uh, much lower than the old, than the large yield uh, strategic weapons. These are true low yield. I mean, uh, state media says you're talking about yields and uh, 50 to uh, 200 tons uh, of yield. These are real low yield weapons. And uh, the possibility that uh, they will be used, I think, is uh, very high. Uh, if uh, uh, Putin uh, initiates a war uh, against the NATO state. And the objective will be to try to get the United States uh, and NATO to back down, uh, except the, the Russian aggression, if, if that were to actually happen, um, uh, it would be a, a catastrophe uh, for Western civilization, uh, to put it uh, mildly. Uh, NATO would effectively uh, be destroyed if it allowed any of its territory to be absorbed by military uh, force uh, by, by the uh, Russian Federation. So um, real, uh, real bottom line, uh, I would suggest that they take the, both the Russian and the Chinese nuclear threat very seriously. Uh, Chinese, by the way, are, 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 are now telling us through um, you know, Global Times, which is their, uh, you know, main English language mouthpiece of the Communist Party of China, that we are substantially underestimating their uh, nuclear capability. Uh, a recent article, uh, this was by the, the chief editor of their uh, publication, um, said they had a thousand nuclear weapons, which is a lot uh, compared to what we've got today, and certainly in terms of our active inventory. Well, thank you, Mark. I want to uh, thank you for the Q&A uh, answers. We're going to go to our audience. But before we do, um, as an alert to our listeners, our next event is Tuesday, March 16th, when the Mitchell Institute will be hosting a panel on augmented reality. And we hope all of you can join us for that. And we're now going to go to our audience for questions. Um, you can participate in the Q&A by using the raise hand function on your device or as some of you have done on the Q&A section, you've 
uh, written a question to be asked, which um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and re refer to Mark. And um, one of the questions Mark asked, uh, Mark was asked this is, aren't we exaggerating modernization in that it's not just I, you're not just including every tweak or upgrade to a system, but you're talking about a new system when you talk about Russian modernization. Could you explain a little bit more of how you define that and why you think that's significant and it's not just a minor upgrade to an existing uh, program? Well, actually, it's just the, uh, the opposite. Most of the 2025 systems uh, we're talking about are clearly new by any definition of what constitutes uh, new. They were not in existence uh, uh, when the Soviet Union died. Uh, they uh, uh, are things uh, that the, so the Soviets, some cases developing, some cases well beyond what the Soviets were developing in, in, in the last years of, uh, of the Soviet Union. I mean, the only systems uh, that uh, we're talking about that uh, would uh, be characterized as a operate of, of existing systems in the missile category, it's the Sinov and Liner, which are uh, major updates of the SSN-23. Uh, with two, two and a half times as many warhead capabilities as well as uh, uh, various operates. When they don't do life extension, when they when they uh, do uh, what we would call life extension, it's really an operate and uh, mil military capabilities. The TU-160M2 uh, is the major operate of, of the bomber, more important than even the electronics and, and the new capabilities they're putting in it are the missiles that it's carries. Uh, there are now um, at least three uh, types of uh, nuclear armed or nuclear capable air launched uh, cruise missiles that have been already introduced uh, into the Russian Air Force to be carried by these uh, bombers, including the new ones. Hypersonic missiles, uh, they're in the process of uh, deploying the, the Kinzel, the, uh, which is the aeroballistic missile maneuvering ballistic uh, missile capability, the smaller version of the Kinzel uh, that will be carried by uh, more of the fighters. Uh, that's that one, uh, according to a very recent Russian press report, will be uh, start testing in 2023. Uh, as of now, there is not uh, certainly uh, there is no announced U.S. program for a nuclear capable hypersonic uh, missile. And I don't believe there's any black program around anywhere trying to to do that. So they're going to have a monopoly on these sorts of capabilities and they're going to get better and better. Uh, they're, they're already claimed uh, they have uh, Mach 9 capabilities on the Zircon uh, powered uh, cruise missile. The Kinzel is in the Mach 10 or Mach 10 plus uh, speed category. Um, US defensive capabilities uh, against these are either non-existent or almost non-existent right now. Uh, we need to do something uh, about this as quickly as we can. Uh, there's no reason why we can't have capabilities against hypersonic uh, missiles. It's just that we didn't uh, give it the money because it wasn't a, a priority because we, until very fairly recently, we basically pretended that uh, there weren't any uh, Russian hypersonic pr programs underway. Now we know that they not only exist, but they're big time things and, and they're getting better. Let me uh, turn Mark now to my friend, David Anhalt, who uh, I was gonna relate his question, but David, why don't you go ahead? I know it's a multi-part question dealing with in part um, command control and communication. And why don't you ask Mark your question and thank you for participating. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and, and Dr. Schneider, uh, th this is where I'm headed with this. Uh, you described this massive program for developing new nuclear weapons of many different types, many different platforms, many different ranges, far exceeding what, uh, what the paint box had during the Cold War. Uh, could you describe outside of the scope of the weapons themselves, but the modernization of Russian nuclear command and control for the deployment of this vast armada uh, in particular, 
Uh, how is the Russian nuclear, modern Russian nuclear command and control different than the old Cold War type? I mean, for instance, are, has Putin delegated decisions for escalating to nuclear war to Russian generals or Russian colonels? I mean, what characterizes this modern nuclear command and control that must be more splendiferous than what the old Cold War version was? Over. Thank you. Well, it, it's similar uh, in, in many respects to the old Soviet system, but much more modern. Uh, they are uh, engaged uh, in the construction of a new generation of ultra deep, ultra hard uh, bunkers. Putin uh, in the uh, 2020 Sochi meetings, and they have an annual meeting for the last 15 years uh, where they talk about their, their uh, you know, military modernization capabilities. This time it was very unusual. Uh, the only public announced uh, things uh, that were said at Sochi related to the strategic uh, nuclear forces and to nuclear command and control. Putin uh, spent uh, one day in, in terms of the open part of the meeting, obviously he, uh, there, there were not, uh, you know, most of the meetings were closed, but he, he talked about their new nuclear um, bomb-proof uh, bunker uh, system uh, that was just about uh, operational. And uh, there have been uh, uh, statements uh, about these in some of the earlier uh, versions of, of the annual report by the intelligence community going back uh, almost 10 years. Uh, so uh, there, this is very credible. credible. And uh, Bill Gertz uh, has written several articles where he's talked about the new bunker construction program. So uh, that you know they they have built the system, which in a practical sense uh, is basically all, uh, virtually impossible to to uh, attack with any uh, real uh, reliability. Uh, we don't have the weapons capability to do it. We we don't uh, we're not developing uh, a weapon that's optimized for uh, attacking these type of facilities. The uh, uh, the perimeter uh, system or, or dead hand that's sometimes called is prob almost certainly I believe still operational. Uh, I don't believe uh, it's particularly sinister in the sense. Uh, the descriptions of it you find in, in Russian open sources is, is one where uh, it will um, function only uh, if the uh, central government is taken out, the military uh, and all the, all the bunkers. It's not something that's automatic. It's something that can be stopped uh, if it were to you know, accidentally activate. And I think the chances of accidental activation are pretty low. Uh, so the, the, the fundamental difference is they take nuclear war seriously. We don't, uh, everything in the US depends on getting the president out of Washington and out of a blast, nuclear blast area before the, the weapons get here. Uh, the problem with that, with the new hypersonic missiles is you may have as little as five minutes uh, warning time. Uh, before you start getting nuclear detonations uh, in Washington. Uh, so uh, we have a very, very serious uh, nuclear command and control problem. Uh, and uh, I think we, it's one of the things we need, really need to do something uh, about. They, you don't want them to believe um, that they can do a preemptive strike and take out the National Command Authority. In 2019, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, uh, made a reference to preemptive attacks on, on the president. Uh, he, he urged the US government to look at the timelines. He didn't elaborate, but the Russian press uh, the next day immediately elaborated and talked about preemptive uh, attacks with hypersonic nuclear missiles uh, against the Com National Command Authority. And then the uh, uh, general, uh, the Army Gerasimov, uh, chief of the general staff, made a very explicit statement uh, about uh, attacking uh, nuclear, uh, well, not nuclear, command and control, uh, national command and control. Uh, and the only way to do that, of course, is with, with nuclear weapons. We uh, our experience with taking out Saddam Hussein is conventional weapons don't work very much in this sort of, uh, uh, this sort of uh, objective. You really do need a nuclear capability if you're going to try to take out uh, 
the government. So uh, I think we need to try to enhance uh, the, the nuclear command and control. We've got to do something about the EMP vulnerability we've allowed to develop. Uh, uh, there's some indications the Air Force is really now taking that seriously and, and going ahead with upgrades on, on EMP vulnerability. And I very strongly uh, support that. It's, it's long overdue. Let me go to Tom Neubauer, who also has a question. Tom? Welcome to the uh, seminar. Uh, let's hear what your question is. Actually, uh, Peter, I don't actually have a question, but I appreciate you seeing my hand up. Okay. Uh, Our last we, caller addressed that very well, thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Tom. Uh, Mark, we did have one other question came in and what is the Russian view of the Chinese nuclear capability? How much does that factor into what the Russians are doing today? Uh, going back 20 years, uh, you can find uh, Russian uh, uh, military officers, most of this is at the 05, 06 level, uh, talking about the size of the Chinese nuclear capability uh, and putting it at levels uh, that are uh, much higher than uh, uh, normal uh, Western estimates in, in uh, that uh, time period. Uh, I think it's clear uh, they take the Chinese nuclear threat very seriously. However, and this is a very big you know, footnote, uh, it's not politically correct in Russia to say that. Uh, so uh, they, uh, they, it, they have to hide that perception. If you talk to them on the margins of conferences where they attend and they, they know you and privately, they'll admit uh, that they, uh, uh, they, they're concerned about Chinese capability, but they won't say it in, in uh, public. They, they're even taking actions to augment, uh, it, to some degree anyway, uh, the Chinese nuclear capability. Um, Victor Mikhailov, uh, who uh, he's, he's now deceased, but uh, he was uh, the uh, chief of, of, or the, uh, the minister for atomic energy in Russia. Uh, he was, after that, he was director of the Sarov nuclear uh, um, weapons laboratory. Uh, used to have a website up and a uh, personal website. And he has a picture of a gold medal uh, awarded uh, to him by China. And he bragged, uh, that it had 87.5 grams of pure gold in it. Now, he didn't get that for nothing. So uh, there are reports uh, that um, uh, Mikhailov was involved in nuclear, illegal in the sense of from a, a, a Russian government standpoint, uh, transfer of data from the Russian nuclear weapons establishment to the Chinese nuclear weapons establishment. Uh, and there are rumors that his firing uh, and demotion, he, uh, he uh, firing lasted one week and he was reinstated, but he was reinstated one level lower uh, as principal uh, uh, head of the uh, atomic energy ministry. There, there are rumors uh, in, in Russian press that that was over transfer of, of nuclear weapons related information uh, to the Chinese. And, and there are reports of technology transfer to the uh, Chinese relating to strategic uh, missile systems. I mean, this is not an enormous body of literature. It's pretty small actually, but I think it's, it's reasonably credible. Well, Mark, I wanna thank you. Uh, come to the end of our, this nuclear deterrent series seminar. A big thanks again to you, sir. and. To our audience and from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute, I want to urge you all to have a great aerospace day. Again, Mark, thank you very much. And I want to particularly thank our staff here at the Mitchell Institute that helped make these possible. They do great work and uh, want to thank them uh, for all the work they do. And again, Mark, thank you for this and uh, thank you, everybody. Take care. <laughs>